Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Regime of Video, we're going to be discussing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with AMD's RX Vega, specifically mining performance and also the difficulties of buying the damn thing, because the cards, as you would expect, are getting snapped up very quickly. And I imagine this latest mining news is probably not going to help things for anyone. Then we're going to move over to Intel, because the 7th generation versus the 8th generation KB Lake Mobile processors have had some preliminary results appear online uh, from a couple of different laptops and the results are actually pretty damn impressive I must say for the 8th generation and then we're going to finish the news with the Xbox One X and other news from Microsoft especially the fact that we will indeed be seeing a keyboard and mouse support coming to Microsoft's console along with sales expectations for the upgraded system as well. But with that said, let's first of all start with RX Vega. Currently, Ethereum is the currency that a lot of people are mining. Now, obviously, different graphics cards bring in different levels of performance. Too long didn't read, you want to bring as much performance to the table as possible while keeping power consumption as low as possible, because obviously electricity costs moolah. Now, typically, an RX 480 or along those lines gets around 25 to 28, perhaps maybe 29, depending on the model, the driver that you're using, and other such things. So, RX Vega 64, according to one Reddit user whose name is Silent Death, has managed to achieve 43.5, and this is at around 130 to 140 watts. Now, what's really impressive about this is he's managed to do so by reducing the power target to minus 24, having a 1000 MHz core clock, and setting the HBM memory to 1100 MHz. Others are currently testing out this particular statement. Uh, we actually have an RX Vega 56. A viewer actually lent it to me. I actually met him in London. Really cool guy. His name's Joe. Um, so, you know, thumbs up, Joe, if you're watching this. And um, he actually lent me a Vega 56, so that was really cool actually to meet him. So I might be doing some Ethereum testing as well, maybe a bit of mining testing, but I'm not 100% sure yet because I'm not exactly, you know, a miner by any stretch of the imagination, but I do imagine some of you want me to test that, so I possibly will, but really most of it is going to be gaming focused. But others are starting to test these um, statements and a lot of folks can't quite match the power usage. So the performance data, yes, they can hit, but many are sucking down more energy than what this user is claiming. And they're saying that they're getting around the 200 to 220 watt reading with their particular card. Thing is, though, even if that's the more realistic number, that's still pretty damn impressive. Because, well, it's almost 15, 16 MHS higher than what, let's say, a 580 would be capable of. And this, by the way, at least according to the Reddit user, he is not using the mining optimized driver. And while there is power, of course, to take into consideration, there are also other things, such as the sheer number of cards that you can plonk into your rig. And some folks might just do some casual mining. For example, they might just have a couple of RX um, Vegas. They, you know, don't have the funds or the desire to build like an entire mining rig. So something like this could be of interest. Unfortunately... The mining craze, along with just shortages of graphics cards in general, and this is not helping, by the way, that GDDR5 memory, as well as 5X memory, is also on the increase in price. Now, I've said this before, and I'll say it again, it's just the perfect storm. And a website by the name of Crypto Coin News has claimed that AMD GPUs are selling out in just five minutes, and it's really pissing off. Uh, gamers, but it's also pissing off miners as well, because it's just it's just absolutely ridiculous. And of course, uh, AMD are pushing this whole software bundle thing, but unfortunately, that doesn't please anyone because what that means is miners aren't getting what they want, which frustrates miners. But gamers aren't getting what they want as well because now they're basically forced to buy a bundle of stuff which they might not even want. Like, what about if they've already pre-ordered those games somewhere else, or what if they're just simply not interested in those games to begin with? So, now let's talk about the 8th generation of Intel processors. Just to clarify, this is not Coffee Lake, as in 
the full fat successor to KB Lake, Intel are doing that thing again, that confusing thing of being Intel. And instead, we have a couple of different processors which technically all fly under the 8th generation flagship. The too long didn't read of this particular 8th generation KB Lake is that you're basically getting more cores than the 7th generation did, but according to Intel anyway, while this obviously will improve performance, it doesn't increase power consumption too much at all. A website by the name of Notebook, Notebook Check, excuse me, has a rather fascinating glimpse into these 8th generation processors. I'll encourage you to check it out. I have linked it in, of course, the video description. They've looked at a different number of uh, laptops slash low power devices under a myriad of different workloads with, of course, the 8th and the 7th generation of processors. Now, the good news is, in general, uh, the 8th generation is definitely distinctly faster. How much faster? Well, of course, it does depend upon the processor. But, for example, the 8250U is around a 40-41% to 41 improvement in the 7200U in some benchmarks. And this is a pretty damn impressive score. Um, for example, if we were to take a look at a different benchmark which is a single thread in nature, that's a Cinebench, the 8250U has about a 10% improvement in single core performance, which is not bad. That's that's pretty reasonable. I mean, you're probably not going to notice it in like Word, 10%, but hey, if you're coming from an older generation of laptop, then this is, it's basically a bonus, right? And so some tasks, especially ones which leverage a large number of cores, the good news is, yes, it would appear that Intel were right. Um, you're going to be seeing a 40-50% improvement in performance from the uh, to the uh, seventh generation to the eighth generation, which is very good. Unfortunately, that's not to say that everything is sunshine and lollipops. There are a couple of issues, according to them. If you constantly put uh, the processor under a lot of work, then yes, the CPU will be good at turboing for shorter workloads. Let's say 15, 20, 30 seconds. So that would be the equivalent of I open up a web browser and perhaps um, maybe doing something like oh I don't know, um, putting together a short video clip, very short video clip, or archiving a small batch of files. The problems come, however, if you are starting to do a lot of workload um, for a prolonged period of time. In which case you start experiencing throttling. And I'll, I'll read this out verbatim, just so there's no uh, ambiguity here. These results could indicate that while the CPU has a good boost for shorter workloads, it may not be able to sustain the peak boost and seem to operate within a 15% margin to the maximum clock speed. This is the i5-8250U and not the i7 with a higher clock speed. However, if KB Lake R is similar to KB Lake, and it is, then we can assume that i7 will likely exhibit even more throttling than the i5 sustained workloads. We'll report this when we have an i7 uh, to test." End quote. So basically, for folks wanting to do a lot of multi-threaded work, then you might start having issues. But the, basically, this is free performance for pretty much the same level of power consumption. So if you were looking to buy a notebook or a laptop or whatever at around the price point of these particular processors in the past, then great. However, if you're expecting this to like treble your performance or something like that, then obviously, well, that's not ideal. And still, the inbuilt GPU is still not going to be enough to, let's say, run Witcher at any anywhere near the um, settings you would be able to get with even like a mobile GTX 1050 type of card. Okay, so last uh, topic for the day is Microsoft. Well, there was a live podcast from PAX West 2017, where Larry Herb, who is, of course, the director of programming Xbox Live, as well as Mike Yubara, who is the vice president of Xbox and Games, uh, sorry, Xbox and Windows Games division, decided to chime in some information on the new system. Now, he does believe that the Xbox One X is going to sell out this holiday. Now, obviously, we're not going to know that until, like, you know, well, essentially the holiday's over. However, my anecdotal statement is that it probably will happen. I mean, the Scorpio is has been very popular. Uh, now, obviously, within just a few days, you couldn't, you basically couldn't pre-order it anymore. Uh, obviously, when the Xbox One X goes on pre-order, I have a feeling it's going to be snapped up pretty quickly. Most, I, I think, 
there's a couple of reasons for this. One, the Switch is still bloody difficult to get hold of, and people, even if they did want a Switch, they'd probably also want a secondary system to go with that. The PlayStation 4 Pro has been out around a year by the time that the Xbox One X goes on sale. It's essentially a year. That's obviously good because that means that people who wanted a Pro probably have one by now. At least people who are affluent enough to pick one up or who had not already really jumped into Sony's ecosystem. So that means that Microsoft basically have their time in the spotlight. Of course, the one negative about the Xbox, well, a couple of negatives. One, the price of the damn thing. I think it's cheap given the level of processing power on offer, but it's not cheap. Um, you know, it's not like you're buying a cup of coffee down Starbucks, really, is it? And the second one is that some of the press they've had about, you know, the, the lack of exclusives recently has certainly hurt them, and that may be one issue. However, they do have a couple of really cool looking games like Cuphead, but of course that's coming to Windows as well as Forza. So it's going to be very interesting to see all of this happening. One very small aside, the Xbox One S consoles are actually on sale at the moment. Not all of them, but some of them have their prices slashed quite considerably. This is obviously in a move to just, well, basically get a larger install base. Now, one area that Microsoft are being quite confident in with the Scorpio slash Xbox One X, is undoubtedly the level of performance. The duo decided to, to recant the fact that, yes, porting a game from the Xbox One to then upscaling it to the Xbox One X is not particularly difficult whatsoever, but we kind of knew that anyway. Um, even things such as ESRAM, because obviously the, the Xbox One X doesn't have it, it's not too difficult. It's basically just a case of them... Um, if there's no specific code path for the game, it will simply say, okay, well, we're going to emulate the ESRAM using, you know, the GDDR5 memory. Not too difficult at all. However, one thing I did find quite interesting is the fact that if you are one of those keyboard and mouse type of players, hint me, to be fair, I'm not really a keyboard and mouse type of person on all games, like something like Assassin's Creed or Batman Arkham, not so much, but... If it's something like, I don't know, an FPS game or something along those lines, I, I, I do prefer keyboard and mouse. That's just my personal preference, of course. So Microsoft are going to be pushing this. And they've said that the decision ultimately is at the hand of a particular studio. So they're not going to just be like, you have to do this. But Microsoft do want to do it for games like, say, Minecraft. So essentially what they want to do is say, hey, we've got the tools to allow this. And of course, how that's going to work in a, in a wider ecosystem. Because I don't care how good you are on a keyboard and mouse versus how good you are on a, a, a joypad. The keyboard and mouse player just ha does have some distinct advantages. And, you know, we all know what those are, so I don't really, really need to go into those in this video. But it just is what it is. And you can have a personal preference, that's great. But I don't necessarily feel that, you know... Um, games which are multiplayer would be a, a competitive multiplayer would be best served allowing these two types of uh, control method, control schemes to kind of clash. But of course, there could be ways of segmenting this, like keyboard and mouse players would fight keyboard and mouse players only, or some games which just aren't competitive. Well, it doesn't really matter, does it? Um, and lastly, and this is certainly not leastly, well, it might be leastly. For me, it's leastly, but you might be interested in it. Um, there are some new forms of interactivity and artificial intelligence which Microsoft are looking to incorporate in Cortana. Now, the basic premise here is that they are looking to enrich user experiences and basically just make the whole thing more interactive and just more functional and fun. Frankly, I admit that I'm not particularly that uh, taken back by this type of stuff. I don't really use it that much. Maybe that's just me. Hey, if so, then it is what it is. Personally, I like a very basic dashboard with my with my games console. At best, I might use it for Netflix if I just can't be bothered to do it any other way. But generally, it's just like, ugh. I just want to put the game in and play it, and I groan a lot if there's like any updates. But that maybe that's just because I'm like an old school gamer or something. Anyway, uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Uh, normal stuff, like, share, subscribe, and comment. Sorry I've been a bit out of it the last couple of days. As I said, Saturday I met up with 
uh, was it Saturday? Yeah, it was Saturday. I was going to say Sunday, but no, it's Saturday. Saturday, I was basically spent most of the day in London with Joe, slash just in London, with the really wonderful things known as uh, the trains being slightly delayed. Uh, and then on top of that, on Sunday, to be honest, I just needed kind of a day off. So today I've done the filming for RX Vega 56. I've done the you know photography and all that crap. And done the, some filming as well and photography for a memory review, which should be popping up the next couple of days, because I managed to accidentally delete the files in the SD card for the last time I did that. I'm a professional. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.